I'm not a professional historian. I'm a total amateur, which means that everything you're going to see here today, you could have done this too. Um, I just had the time. Uh, uh, I'm a native Vermonter, moved back here after being 45 years away three years ago, and um, bought a house in East Dorset. And um, I don't know whether anybody here has had the same experience, but realtors sometimes tell you things about your house that you find out are not necessarily the case. So I was told one such story, and uh, we went ahead and bought the house anyway, and then afterwards I continued to do the research. So basically what you're going to see here is something where you start with a little bit of information and it just keeps snowballing. You know, have you ever been caught in something like that? <laughs> so that's what happened to me. I started researching the house that we bought in East Dorset, and it just kept snowballing. And um, it's fascinating, actually, the story. I feel like I have a whole group of imaginary friends <laughs> that nobody else has <laughs> of people that used to live in my house and their relatives and their children. And I have all these stories now. So I highly recommend doing this kind of research. It's very interesting. So what we're going to start with today is um, uh, this is an overview, a very lovely painting that was done in the late 19th century of Dorset Mountain. You see it's focusing on the Italian marble mountain and mills. And this is taken from the East Dorset side of the mountain. So that's what you're seeing here with the mills right about here and the railroad running along here and the school that used to be here that is no more. In fact, I said to my husband, with a little bit of artistic license, this almost could have been painted from up in our attic or something. If somebody were up in our attic, yeah. and there were not as many trees as there are today, right, Elizabeth? It might have looked something like that. OK, so we're here to uh, give you uh, an armchair driving tour of East and North Dorset, actually. And each, each one of you, I think, has a, a copy of the map. And so um, after the presentation, or any time now, you're welcome to do the driving tour. Um, it starts in the extreme upper left corner. Let me see, I should get a copy of this. Hold on, Jim, let me just get a copy of what I'm talking about. <laughs> Thank you. So if you wanted to do, you know, today after the talk, if you wanted to get over to East Dorset and you didn't know how, you would start up here at the Dorset Historical Society. Which this part is way out of scale now, but I wanted it all to be on one page, right? So that's basically what you're looking at here. Dorset Historical Society would be over here. You would come down Route 30 over Morse Hill Road, way up over Dorset Mountain and back down and over here and up Route 7A and start the talk uh, right here. I've tried to give you a little star right here in the middle to say that's where my talk is going to begin today. And if you wanted to do the tour, you could, you could start there too. OK, so because education is my background, I, I trained to be a teacher, I like to start with a pretest. What was the first name of the Wilson House? What did Mad Tom Road used to be called? How is Bill Wilson related to Vermont's first millionaire? Name the doctor who gave up medicine to be a farmer. Where did the inventor of the clothes ringer live? Hint, it's in East Dorset. <laughs> Which lake has its own cemetery? Where did the Green Mountain Boy and Tory live, the same man? Where was the town poor farm? Who built the Wilson House Hotel? And which house was Vermont's first model home? Anybody know all those answers? You can be excused. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know any of these. When I first started researching this, I didn't know any of these. OK, so let's start with stop number one. All right, so if you were here just east of the word East Dorset on your map, stop number one is right here. And on your map, I show you a number one hotel is the word next to it, OK? And this is the Wilson House Hotel. A picture is from 2010, but it was built in 1852 by a man named Ira Cochran. 
He was quite the guy. The Cochrane family really owned East Dorset in the 19th century. He was a child, moved over here from Peru, Londonderry, that area with his, with his family, he's one of five children. He had a brother, John Cochrane, and the two of them, John was a lawyer and Ira was the businessman, and he was involved in lumber and marble, became a very, very wealthy man. The two of them became very, very wealthy men. He was also instrumental in bringing the railroad to town and knew how to buy and sell uh, property to the railroad and made a lot of money that way. Here's a same uh, view, a little more from the southeast now in about the year 2010 from a postcard that was made. And opposite on the other side, sort of catty corner, uh, was where the train depot was located, right? Here's the train depot. This house is still here. It's a private residence now, but you'll still see that. You'll recognize that very square shape of the house, right? So the hotel is over here now. It's opposite the post office, right? Yes, that's right. The post office these days is right over here. Yeah. This is the house right across the street. The hotel is right here now. This is the sidewalk in front of the hotel, OK? And across the street now to the north side of the street is stop number two, all right? On your map, stop number two is the church. <clears throat> and this church original is the oldest one in Dorset, actually. There's a, a church right over here on Church Street here in Dorset. But it has had two fires in its history, in its long history. This one never has had one. Um, um, and uh, it was originally called a Union Society Church. And it was meant to be a non-denominational place where people of all faiths could come and, and pray, pray. But none of the groups alone had enough followers that they could have their own church. And so they built this as a, as a union uh, meeting house, shall we say. And here's your view straight on from the west. As you're driving in on Mad Tom Road, this is the front of the church. It's the Congregational Church today. OK, across the road. Now, by the way, let me just interject. There's a whole separate talk that is given that's just a, a walking tour of just beautiful downtown East Dorset. That's a separate talk. Um, and in fact, we're in the process right now, early, early stages of trying to get beautiful downtown East Dorset Village on the State Register of Historic Places. Uh, so you heard it first here. It's going to take some work. It's going to take a lot of, a lot, a lot of uh, research on every single house that's there. We have to get the neighbors to agree they want to be part of such a thing. But anyway. Um, so this, what you're looking at today, really is a driving tour. I'm not going to tell you about every house that's in the village. But I am going to tell you this was Ira Cochran's house, subsequently owned by the Grouts, sub subsequently owned by the Buffums. And this is what's known as the um, Eve's Front Greek Revival style. Now, the early uh, 19th century was when the Greek Revival style became very, very, very popular. When I say the eaves front, I mean this portion right here. This is the eaves, right? You've heard the term under the eaves, perhaps. OK, so this is the eaves front Greek Revival. Usually, there's lights around above the door and to the side of the door. So this is uh, uh, inside the door, there's a stairway that goes straight up to the second floor. This is not a center hall colonial. A center hall colonial, you open up the door, and you've got a central hall right there, an entrance space. This goes directly up the stairs to the second floor. Right around the corner on Village Street is where his brother, John Cochran, lived. And I think you can see the two houses side by side are almost identical. Perhaps they had the same. Uh, builder build the two of them this Eve's front Greek Revival style. And let me just go back one here to show you the red uh, indicators here are all of the Cochrane um, uh, land holdings in the East Dorset in about 1869. Ira had the contract to supply the railroad 
with the wooden railroad ties, if you can imagine. How many ties were needed to bring the railroad in, into western Vermont? So he had the contract to supply uh, all of that lumber to the railroad. And so he had a lumber spout built. And on your map, this here is the lumber spout. And what that refers to is the dip in the mountains here, which you can still see today. He had a, I'm not quite sure if it was a wooden slide kind of thing, if you will, that he had built, that he could slide the lumber, the finished lumber, down the mountain, or whether he sent them down the river, because there's Mad Tom River right here. I'm not quite sure. That, this takes a little more research to actually maybe find a picture of what a lumber spout looked like in the first half of the 19th century. But he had it built, and he had his uh, uh, lumbering business up in the mountains and then sent the finished lumber down the mountainside via the spout uh, and made it available for houses, railroads, whatever. One thing to try to imagine as you're doing this driving tour around uh, East Dorset is that way before we had cows all over the place in Vermont, we had sheep. And this is a, an image, uh, a postcard that is part of the Bennington Museum collection of a flock of sheep. And the interesting thing is sheep mow down everything. And so the landscape was a lot more barren when there were sheep grazing everywhere than today when we have cows grazing in not so many places anymore. So just bear that in mind. Try to imagine the landscape a lot more barren and uh, picturesque with the sheep, I think. OK, the next stop on your driving tour is going to be a little red house on the right. This was known as the McDaniel House for both maps. Now, when I say both maps, what I mean is the copy that you have here is the 1869 Beers Atlas map. There's another one just before the Civil War, the Rice Harwood map of 1856. And so we're fortunate to have two very good maps of just before the Civil War and just after the Civil War. And as you can see, a there's a little dot for every house that existed at that time, along with the cursive writing that shows you who lived in that house. And so this was called the McDaniel House uh, through most of the 19th century, in fact. It's, the style is called a three-quarter Cape Cod. Can you guess why the front? is three quarter? Is it missing a quarter by any chance? The other window. Right. If it had four windows across the front, that would be your standard Cape Cod style. So this is called a three quarter Cape Cod style because it only has the three windows. Okay? It's quite rare as you drive around now, so you're going to be an educated driver. This is one of my favorite things. When I drive around, I'm looking at houses and I'm trying to guess, hmm, when was that added? I bet you that wasn't there originally. I bet you those windows are a later addition, et cetera. So I, th I think this will happen to you too, now that you know what to look for. The other thing to remember about this house, the Mr. and Mrs. Hyde bought it 50 years ago now. And it was originally much closer to the road. It originally sat right about here. This is the remnants of a stone foundation. When you look at this house on the east side of Mad Tom Road now, you will see more or less a pile of rocks here and some small trees. That's where the house used to be. The barn that goes with the house is still there. And you'll see the barn is still very close to the road. But the house used to be much closer to the road also. And it was always just a little farm of about 30 acres. OK, the next stop on your uh, uh, tour is what was the Dr. Williams house and then became the Sexton house. This is what it looks, well, we don't know this is what it looked like. But I do know that in 1826, this house was purchased. This style is called your gable front Greek revival. A gable is a roof pitch that looks like this, right? So do you see the, the pitch right here? So this is the other style of Greek Revival. It's called a gable front Greek Revival. Dr. Albemarle Williams bought this in 1826 at a probate sale. He was of the Williams family in Massachusetts. 
the money for which started Williams College. He's related to that family. Um, he only lived, unfortunately, in the house for four years before dying at age 40, unfortunately. Left his widow with eight children. Um, must have been sad times. Um, uh, note that the uh, red barn that you see at the bottom left corner there, again, another example of a building being moved. That used to be on the other side of the road and was just recently, I say recently, moved in the 1930s to where it is now. So just bear that in mind. You know, This is a place where buildings were moved all the time. So I'm imagining in my head that across the road where the barn used to be, there is a stream that runs through there. And I'm imagining sheep all over the place down in there at the side of the stream. And then the barn is where they went at night on the other side of the road. <clears throat> OK, so I'm going to be throwing in some Courier and Ives prints for you throughout this presentation because they were executed at about the same time period uh, of a lot of the houses that I'm going to be talking about. So just remember that the kind of things that Courier and Ives portrayed were pretty close to reality, pretty close to the time period that they were painting. So as in this house, in this Courier and Ives print, you can see they did it right. They've got the red barn on the other side of the road and the house is on this side. Presumably, it was so you could keep an eye on your barn if it caught fire, keep an eye on your animals, your horses, whatever, on the other side of the road. As far as dating houses, one of the things that you have to look at, in case you ever seriously get into this, is you have to look at the, the uh, saw marks or the hash marks that are to be found on the framework of these early houses. Uh, in that yellow house that I just showed you, Dr. Williams' house, the date on it is 1826. We know it was purchased by him in 1826. But guess what? All of the tool marks inside on the framework of that house are all circular saw marks. The circular saw did not appear in Dorset until 1840. So we've got a little bit of a mystery here. It's very possible that that yellow house that I just showed you wasn't exactly there in 1826. Maybe it burned? We don't know. But we know that the framework shows the signs of a circular saw, which is round uh, saw marks, as opposed to hash marks, which is what you would get. And this is how uh, uh, big chunks of lumber were cut before the circular saw was invented. Um, as you see, it's called a pit saw. And one man got down in the pit, and the other man was above the pit, and they worked the saw up and down and up and down. It must have been brutal work. I can't imagine how hard it must have been. OK, this is just um, a painting that I found from about 1820 that might be something like a, a domestic scene from Dr. Williams' house. This is the clothing. This is the kind of interior that you would find of a house of this time period in, in New England. And this next slide is actual pieces of Vermont furniture, again, from the same time period, 1810 to 1830. These are actually in the collection of the Bennington Museum. So Dr. Williams, I'm hoping, was wealthy enough uh, doing well enough as a doctor that he was able to supply his home with pieces of furniture like this. Believe it or not, we have not been able to find the actual notice of his death. He died early, age 40. We have not been able to find in any of the old newspapers that he died, which seems strange to me. A country doctor is a really important man, right? Delivering babies and farm accidents and all kinds of things, right? The only thing we have found is a reference to the fact that he was a Mason. He belonged to, uh, let's see, he was born in Wells. I think he belonged to the Pulteney uh, Masonic chapter up there. And um, we know George Washington was a Mason. We don't have a picture of Dr. Albemarle Williams, but we know from newspaper accounts that he was a Mason. We also know from reading his probate his probate is all to be found online, believe it or not, through Ancestry.com, that he owned a one-horse sleigh. This is a three-horse sleigh. He owned a one-horse sleigh. 
And this is his widow, Ruth Goodrich, Mrs. Albemarle Williams. They were both from Wells. And uh, as I just said, when he died, she was left with six children to raise. The eldest son, as was the custom at the time, inherited the farm. He got everything, so he lived his life in, here in East Dorset, in fact. Uh, and she and the rest of the children moved west. And uh, she, in fact, died in Michigan, along with a couple of the other children. So here's the same house. This is that same yellow house, Dr. Williams's house became the Sexton House. This is from a postcard that was made of this house from about 1910. The house was sold uh, by uh, the son, Daniel G. Williams, to the man next door. The farmer next door was named uh, Joseph Sexton. Joseph Sexton was the grandson of George Sexton, who was at the Battle of Bennington during the Revolutionary War. And George Sexton's diary of that account of the Bennington battle is now part of the Vermont Historical Society records, the archives. And you could go read George Sexton's account of the Battle of Bennington up there in Barrie. So anyway, Joseph Sexton was the grandson of this George Sexton. He moved right next door. He bought Daniel Williams's house with his third wife. This is Joseph Sexton's third wife. Uh, his first wife and daughter are listed in the 1840 census, and then they are not listed anymore. So presumably illness, something happened to his wife and, and first little girl. His second wife, uh, he was again uh, in the, living in the house next door at the time, and he had a son and three daughters with her. When the son was killed in the Civil War, he sold that house to his brother, I'll show you that in a minute, and moved next door, bought Daniel Williams's house, and moved there with his third wife. She was a widow, Anna Damon Luther Sexton. Try to remember her, because I have a really interesting story to tell you about how the two of them met way back in 1860, it was. So, to get, so she brought her three children with her from Massachusetts, and they added to Joseph's three daughters. They had a full house next door, so I'm presuming that's why they bought Dr. Williams's house right next door. Presumably the house was bigger. And together they had two children. Um, this is a portrait on the left of the daughter Cora Sexton, who married the hired hand. George Copping was a hired hand from Canada who was helping her father, George Sexton, on the farm. They married. And then uh, they also had uh, another, a son, her brother, George Sexton. So this is where they, Joseph Sexton originally was living, right next door. So if you look on your map here, you'll see stops five and six. And can you see on the map, it actually says J. Sexton, written next to the dot for stop number five. And it says B. Sexton, next to stop number six. OK? So this is another story now of two brothers, right? I just told you about Ira Cochran and his brother John. And now you have two houses side by side of Joseph Sexton, who was the eldest of six, and his youngest brother, Benjamin, who was the youngest of six. So um, this section that, I'm looking, that you're looking at right here, this is the original Greek Revival section of the house. When you drive by, remember that. This is the original section. The present owners have hugely added on to this house. Okay, So the middle section and the barn have been added on by the present owners. It's a really lovely property. They've done a terrific job. Um, as I understand it, it was, had really gone to rack and ruin, such that the present owners even had a hard time getting an agent to show them this house. That's how bad it was. Now, they've been here 30 years, and um, you'll see when you drive by, it's the most impressive residence. But anyway, when Joseph Sexton moved next door, bought Dr. Williams's house, he then uh, 
sold, I have a feeling, more or less gave um, that house to his uh, youngest brother, Benjamin. And this is Benjamin's wife, Hannah Brock, who likewise was the grandchild of a Revolutionary War soldier. Maybe this is Joseph Sexton with his first wife, Minerva, in his youth. All right, so this is the Courier and Ives image from the four seasons of life, this one being youth. We don't have any images of Joseph nor of Minerva. Maybe this is the two of them. Maybe this is Joseph and Clarissa Towsley, Sexton, his second wife. She was a Towsley from over here, this side of the mountain. Together they had three girls and a boy. See, just like, just like here in the Courier and Ives image, a little boy and three little girls, okay? So in his middle age, he married his second wife, Clarissa. Uh, and she died in 1858. We don't have a picture of the son. We don't have any pictures at all of Edgar. No Civil War photos of him at all. All we know, we have records where he is mentioned. And this, in fact, is the, um, the Civil War flag. The 14th Regiment, Company C, mustered out of Manchester. And Edgar Sexton was in that group. He enlisted in the fall of 1862. This is the memorial um, poster, shall we say, that commemorated the service of the men from Manchester in Company C. Edgar is listed, one of these over here is Edgar T. Sexton. And this is the only real visual we have, is this memorial bulletin which was produced at the end of the war. If, if you're especially interested in the history of Vermonters in the Civil War, I can recommend the UVM website. www.cdiuvm.edu is where you can find just about anything you can imagine um, about Vermonters in the Civil War. So in addition to Edgar, there were the three girls. We have Minerva Sexton Brophy, Teresa Sexton Barrows, and Helen Sexton Buffum. Does anybody know any Brophies here in town? <laughs> yes. Does anybody, has anybody ever heard the word Barrows? Mm -hmm. And Buffums, does anybody know any Buffums? I don't think they're in Dorset anymore, but I do think there are a few left in Vermont. So these are the sisters, Minerva, Teresa, and Helen. So what did I just say? Minerva married Harvey Brophy. Harvey Brophy came back from the Civil War. He was in uh, Company H of the 2nd Regiment of Vermont Sharpshooters. And I don't know if you heard Howard Coffin, the Vermont Civil War historian, on the radio. Oh. Maybe it's been a year ago now. But he received uh, a letter, a personal letter, from somebody, I believe it was in Alabama, who was, a, so a Confederate soldier who was writing home to his family. And in the letter, he said, he was talking about a particular battle that that particular man had been in, in which he says, if not for the Vermont sharpshooters, we would have won. So apparently, they were pretty good. So does anybody know what it took? to be a Vermont sharpshooter? Well, this is the bulletin that was posted in various public spaces. No person will be enlisted who cannot, when firing at a distance of 200 yards, so that's 600 feet, right? 600 feet, put 10 consecutive shots into a target. The average distance not to exceed five inches from the center of the bullseye. 600 feet, that's a long ways. I mean, I don't think this building is 600 feet long, right? So that's about a tenth of a mile, right? 5,280 feet is one mile. So 600 feet is a little more than a tenth of a mile. So on your way home, in your car, check it out. You know, check out what is one-tenth of a mile, and that'll give you an idea of how good these guys had to be. Ten consecutive shots in the center of a bullseye, not more than five inches away from the center. 
So he was pretty good. This is the marriage certificate that they have here in the Historical Society uh, when Helen Sexton married John Buffum. And this is Teresa Sexton Barrows with Experience Barrows. I love his name, don't you? And he was the grandson. He was not the original Experience Barrows who came up here from Connecticut. So he was the grandson. And together, after they, when they first married, uh, she moved over to this side of the mountain. The Barrows farm was up in the hollow. Very, very fine location, right? Even today, that's some of the finest real estate in the country, if you ask me. And they ran a farm for about 20 years. And then they decided to open the farm up and more or less run a guest house. And they wanted to focus on artists. All kinds of artists could come for the summer months and live with them. And eventually, that uh, guest home, you might call it, up there in the hollow, came right down here to Route 30. And so the Barrows House today is a direct descendant of Teresa Sexton Barrows and her husband, Experience. Okay. I show you this, and I promise there are not going to be very many examples of places that you cannot see anymore, but this is one. Further on up the road, let's see, further on up the road, stop 7. This is 7A, and 7B is, a, is the Jerish residence. But at one time, the Benson, Bensons owned this house and the house across the road. And I include this just to show you, this house existed until about 2010. A friend of mine took this photograph, and she said the next time she went back to photograph it again, it was gone. It had been knocked down, and a new house was built behind it. But this is still, and I want you to recognize this, this is still that Greek Revival style. This is that gable front Greek Revival style, with this time the door is in the center. Like if you remember on the yellow house, and you remember on the, the two sexton houses right next door to each other, those doors were offset. But sometimes the house was in the middle. And so I want you to remember that. Same with the next house up the road, 7B, was also a Benson home. Today, it's the Mad Tom Orchard. But again, here's the same gable front, Greek Revival style. So it's interesting to me that on Mad Tom Road, you're going to see, uh, starting with the yellow house, and then the, the, the first sexton house, and then the second sexton house, stops number uh, five and six, and s both 7A and 7B are all basically that gable end Greek Revival style. And then things get added or taken off as the years go by. The shutters make a really big difference, don't they? A decent paint job makes a really big difference, <laughs> right? And I'm going to show you another example even later of a before and an after of what, a, what an amazing thing a paint job is. So in this one, you had a porch that was added across the front. And that kind of camouflages the, the wing that's coming off to the side, doesn't it? You can't really see the side doorway that you could see on the uh, yellow house in particular. OK, at the time of uh, Joseph Sexton's death in 1880, his farm was about 300 acres. And he owned all the way from the yellow house all the way on up to this orchard. All of that on the west side of the road was his. He had about 100 sheep. 100 sheep, about 300 acres. And now it's um, being run as the Mad Tom Orchard. So maybe Courier and Ives visited. <laughs> A very lovely view of apple picking, perhaps, up there at, at the Mad Tom Road house. Maybe they visited. OK, and your last stop on Mad Tom Road is this very lovely, it was originally the Caleb Buffum house. It's presently uh, Nancy Russell's house. Does anybody know the painter? Nancy Russell. This is her house. Very lovely, exceptional job they have done. So what you're going to do on the map now, you're going to drive stop number eight. You're going to go from the Mad Tom Orchard, keep on going. It's sort of a downhill kind of ride up here to stop number eight, where it says H. Buffum. And you're going to have to do maybe a three-corner uh, 
park and then back up and, and come back down. This is what you're going to do here. You're going to go up to the to uh, the Buffalo House and have to turn around and come back down and uh, keep your uh, drive going this way down Bowen Hill Road. But are you ready? Let me show you what this house used to look like. This used to be the town poor farm. It was a, the town poor farm was originally located on the west side, P or Peace Street up here on the west side of town and then it was moved over to Mad Tom Road. And so this is what it looked like in about the year 1900. Again, another, another great example of what a, some decent landscaping and a paint job can do, right? So on this farm, they had about 18 uh, head of cattle, dairy, dairy cows. So they were, the people who stayed at the poor farm had to work it. They had to work it uh, to eat. So they were, they were milking cows, they were gardening in the summertime, they were doing maple sugaring. Uh, perhaps like we know there was an East Dorset cheese factory in North Dorset, in fact. And so it wasn't that far a drive, uh, perhaps in the winter, you know, to take a sleigh as Courier and Ives have portrayed here. Perhaps this is what maple sugaring looked like it's of the same time period from the poor farm, but the people there uh, were not expected to stay there forever, and they were expected to pull their own weight as long as they stayed there, and then they could move on. Okay, so back to our map here. So that's, that's the end up here. This is the Buffum House. You're going to do a three-point uh, turnaround, shall we call it, right? And come back down Mad Tom Road, and you're going to stop right about here. Okay? We're going to talk about stop nine and stop ten. After turning around at the poor farm, head back down, and on the right is just a cleared open field now. But there used to be a lumbering uh, company there called the Wheeler Wright Company. It shows up on the previous, the, old, the, the older map, the earlier map, I should say. It does not show up on your map. But it's stop number nine on your map. And what strikes me in this photo is how many horses were necessary to do this kind of work. When you count them up, there are nine horses here. Almost one for every man, it seems. So apparently, moving the trees around, right, moving the, the big tree trunks around, getting them lined up to go into the uh, mill required a lot of horsepower. Before the days of cars, of course. We're talking the late 19th century now. So the circular saw had been invented. Do you see it here? Here's the circular blade, you see, right here. So the logs would come in from the left side of the photo, slide along, and with the circular blade, they could make pieces of lumber like that. Okay. As I say now, you're not going to see any of that. It's all been knocked down. As far as I could tell, it was only operational for maybe 10 years. But this, this region of Mad Tom Road was called Wheelerville. And some people even today remember that it was called Wheelerville. And I think it was because the Wheeler Lumber Company, Wheeler Wright and Company, was located right there at the corner. Okay. On the other corner now, stop number 10, just as you're barely starting down uh, Bowen Hill Road, there used to be a schoolhouse. This was schoolhouse number nine. And again, I want you to see how barren the landscape was. Between the sheep and the lumber, lumbering men, the landscape really didn't look too terrific. I know when I drive around this part of Vermont, I think, we must be living in a golden age. I can't imagine that it ever looked more beautiful than it looks now. You know, especially all the houses are cared for, all the landscaping, everybody has gardens, I mean, especially at this time of year, right? So I'm thinking right now we live in a real golden age. So try to imagine that the landscape was much more barren than it is today due to the sheep and due to the lumbering operations. Okay, continuing. Uh, driving down Bowen Hill Road now, on the right used to be <laughs> a very lovely house. It was there, there, the, the, the road is called the Bowen Hill Road, 
because the Bowens lived in two houses on this road. The one on the right, as you're driving down the road, the one on the right used to be this one. The early map has them living here. On the left side of the road is what you're going to see. All right, you're not going to see this house anymore, but just on the left side of the road, you're going to see a, a very cute little house, which used to be the granary. The building on the left used to be the granary, which is now a residence. And then to the right is uh, a barn, which has been very extensively renovated. The previous owner, word has it, the previous owner was very proud of this barn and spent $150,000. This is what I was told. This is hearsay, so I, I haven't seen any documents on this. But I do know there's a sign inside that commends the workman who did all the work restoring this barn. So if you're lucky and, and you're driving by someday uh, and the owners are out in the yard, you might stop and chat them up a little bit about their barn and they might be happy to give you a tour of that barn. But it's been very, very heavily restored. Apparently it was really falling in um, when these folks bought it, the previous owner. Previous owner, now the present owners just bought it, I think just last summer. So further on down the road now, down Bowen Hill Road, you're going to come to stop number 12. This is where the Bowen family moved to. So in the early part, before the Civil War, they were living in the house we just talked about. After the Civil War, you find them living here. This house also has been very heavily and lovingly uh, renovated, shall we say. I'm not going to use the word restored. I'm going to use the word renovated. But I'm wondering if, if this is also a gable front Greek revival, but perhaps the center doorway was replaced with this addition, this window. I'm guessing, you know, when I drive by, I try to figure these things out. Um, this is a new entrance here. So maybe this is where the central doorway that you've seen on the other Greek revival houses was located. Okay, the barn, the house itself has been heavily renovated, but the barn, the, the red barn is still on the other side of the road and that's the clue. In fact, there are two buildings on the other side of the road that are still pretty much in original condition. You can tell it's an old farmstead because of the barns. So here's another image of the Bowen family around 1906. The man at the right, Andrus Bowen, also was a local uh, journalist and his pen name was Cyclone. <laughs> kind of cute, huh? So that's, that's the man on the right, Andrus Bowen. Now, this was at the time period. The reason why there were sheep everywhere was there was a real sheep craze going on. The Spanish Merino sheep had been more or less smuggled into the country from Spain in the early uh, quarter of the century. And this is an image of a prize-winning sheep that was raised up in uh, Middlebury, Addison County. And his name was Sweepstakes. <laughs> the animal himself weighed 133 pounds, and the fleece itself was 27 of those pounds. Isn't that amazing? Now, when you look at um, agricultural survey or census data that the, the government did uh, an agricultural census of 1850, 60, 70, and 80. And they surveyed all the farmers in the country. And when you look at those figures, you can see that for somebody who had 100 sheep, they were only selling about 350 pounds of fleece. So to me, that says either they weren't feeding them <laughs> the right things or the local sheep had not been interbred with the Merino sheep such that they were not producing anywhere near the amount of fleece that the Merino sheep was able to produce. I mean, imagine that, 27 pound, a 27 pound piece of wool, piece of fleece came off this animal. That's pretty impressive, but it's not, it's not the norm. This is the point I'm trying to make. 
Okay, so from here, we're going to go, when you come over to Route 7, you're going to come up this way, up into what was called North Dorset. And this is an image of Lake Emerald with the island in the middle from about 1950, 1952. And I'm going to show you next a few houses that used to be there before Lake Emerald became the state park that we enjoy today. The Fairman home was there on Lake Emerald. The Burnham home was there at Lake Emerald. A man named Robert Shaw, a businessman from Brooklyn, had come up here to Vermont to Dorset on vacation, liked what he saw, really liked Emerald Lake, and thought he would buy up all the property he could. And he ended up buying 1,600 acres so that he could turn it into a development. They were going to be called North Dorset Acres. And so he bought all of these old properties and then renovated them to the degree that they needed and put together a summer camp there. He didn't finish the whole plan, but this is an image of the main dormitory building on the left of this camp that he put together and the octagonal dining hall on the right. Now, unfortunately, he died. Unfortunately for him, he died before he was able to finish all of his plans. And his brother inherited the property, and the brother had no interest in developing North Dorset Acres. So uh, it ultimately became the state park that we all know today. I'm putting this picture in here because every once in a while, I come across a piece of research that just stops me in my tracks. And this was one such picture that I had just not been able to forget. I was researching that history that I just told you about uh, the other day, in fact, up in Barrie at the Vermont Historical Society in a particular magazine from 1931 that had the story about Lake Emerald and it being developed. And I came across this picture. And these, the story was about a new children's aid society that was being put together. And the story said that due to the First World War and due to the Spanish flu epidemic, there was a high number of orphans now living in Vermont. And this picture just grabbed me. I don't know if it'll have the same effect on you. So at the same time that we have people like Robert Shaw buying up all this property and planning to develop it into something really nice, at the other end of the spectrum, we had children like this. And what's so dear is they're holding hands. Isn't that sweet? I hope it wasn't just staged, you know? But anyway, so I, I just wanted to share this with you because sometimes this happens when you're doing research. You, you come across something that just you just take off your glasses and put down your pen, you know, and um, it's a real throwback. Anyway, so the railroad, the railroad was coming through town, as we discussed, uh, in the 1850s. We were talking about Ira Cochran, right, and his brother. By, the, by 1950 and 60, that railroad stop was no longer in service, and the station actually was turned into a gas station. Some of you, if you're local, you might remember. I remember this gas station, in fact. But see the car, the little VW? OK, so here's the entrance to Lake Emerald Lake now on the west side of Route 7 as you're going north, right? This is what it looked like today in the winter. OK, let's stop and, and look very closely now. The same book, sorry, Jim. <laughs> the same book where you can find this kind of map is in a book like this. And this is called the, this is the Beers Atlas. And this is where you can find all of these old maps from 1869. So this is the Dorset map. And you, you've got a piece of this map there that you're holding. That's going to be your driving tour. Then there are also close up maps, you see, of East Dorset, 
North Dorset, South Dorset. And that really zooms in so that you can see more who were the people that actually lived here at that time. I have the early map, by the way. If anybody really wants to see the, the pre-Civil War map, that's this one. This is the Rice Harwood map. Okay? You have the later map from 1869, just after the Civil War. Okay? But if you would like to see the early one, it's right here. So let's stop and look at the close-up map just for a minute, because I want you to focus in on this stop right here. This house is that of Welcome Allen. It was a neighborhood of farmers and craftspeople, people who really knew their stuff in terms of cutting marble. Some of them were marble, marble men who went down into the quarries. Some of them were marble sculptors who were making uh, headstones gravestones. Some of them were carpenters. Mrs. Roberts right here was a cheesemaker. She made the most pounds of cheese of anyone in town on an annual basis. This is a steam mill here. This is Welcome Allen's machine shop and furnace. Does anybody know what maybe he was making in that furnace across the road? I'm going to show you a picture later on. He was baking, if you will, all sorts of iron pieces, stoves, wheels, uh, tools, axes, anything that could be made out of iron, he was making in his furnace across the road from his home. His partner was Timothy Rideout. Interesting that on this map, it shows them as if they're two men living side by side, right? It was actually a duplex. Let me show you the picture. This is what that house looked like. Remember what I said about a coat of paint <laughs> being really, really important? This is what that, the same house looked like at about 1900 on the west side of the road. So when you turn left, as if you were going to go into uh, Lake Emerald, on the right, there are some re rental properties right now. This is where the Griffith House was. It was known as the Griffith House after it was Welcome Allen's house because his daughter, Maria Allen, married into the Griffith family. Does anybody know? Does that ring a bell? The, the name Griffith? Does that ring a bell to anybody? Silas Griffith House in Danby. Right? Silas Griffith of Danby, yeah. just, just north of the next town up from Dorset, was Vermont's first. Lumber baron. He was a lumber baron. Exactly. He was another lumberman cutting down all the trees in sight. He was Vermont's first millionaire, Silas Griffith. Welcome Allen's daughter married into that family of his Griffiths. So at the time this was sold, in the 1950s, more on that in a minute, it was, everybody knew it as the Griffith house. Nobody knew it was Welcome Allen's house. Okay, another view of that house at the time of the move now, 1952. This is what it looked like inside. When this house was bought in 1952, the entire house, all the plaster had been removed from the walls. Anybody have an idea of why you might do that to a house? Is that the house that was moved up to? Uh, it was. And then you could remove it with plaster on it so it would come off anyway. The, the Griffiths were planning to move it. <laughs> The Griffiths were planning to move it back from the road because they knew that Route 7 was going to be developed. And the lake was being developed into a state park. So they went in and had all the plaster removed, unfortunately. So this is what it looked like. Every room in the house had the plaster removed. And you're looking at the split lath interior now of the walls. This is an example of the kind of cast iron heating stove that Welcome Allen was making in his furnace across the road. Electra Havemeyer Webb was the name of the woman who was putting together the Shelburne Museum in the 1950s. And so one of the things, how many people here have visited the Shelburne Museum already? Okay, not everybody. 
You need to go up there. I'm going to tell you the story of this house, so when you visit the Shelburne Museum, you'll know all about it. What Mrs. Havemeyer, Mrs. Webb, Electra Havemeyer Webb, did was she collected Vermont folk art, right, all over the state, all over New England, and she especially moved houses, buildings, from all over Vermont to put together the Shelburne Museum. Did you know that? In fact, one of the things I read in the archives up there at the museum today is that landscape is so changed that there's only one patch of rhubarb that's original. <laughs> OK? So she had agents who went around the state and helped her find things, that sh buildings that she might want to move. So she had a man, a, a lawyer from Danby, named Sidney Whalen who in July of 1952 went through this house and wrote to her about it. Let's see, let's look at what it looks like today. Okay, this is what it looks like today. Wanna to go back and see again, refresh your memory as to how bad it looked, right? So this is what it looks like when Mrs. Webb saw it driving to Manchester one day to visit her sister. She saw this dilapidated wreck of a house on the side of the road and for some reason decided she had to have it. <laughs> so she sent Mr. Whalen to talk to the Griffiths about purchasing it. So he writes to her, the lawyer from Danby writes to her to say, my dear Electra, went through the little house at East Dorset this morning with its owner, who offers it as is, with its marble steps, marble flagging and foundation veneer for $200. That's how much the Griffiths wanted. $200. Curiously enough, its former owner had prepared it for removal to a higher site in back and further from the main road, and in doing so had taken the plaster from all the interior walls, which would seem to make it that much easier for your purposes, right? Like, like you just said. It was a good thing there was no plaster. You didn't have to worry about any cracked plaster if you're going to move a building, right? The lath old split hemlock is intact throughout. It seems strange to me that there isn't a fireplace in the entire house. And I couldn't see whether there ever had been one in the past. Although you'd think surely there must have been one originally. It's now fitted for stovepipes in three or four unattractive chimneys. All right, so he's talking about there used to be four stoves there, but there never was a fireplace. The new thing was to have stoves. Well, Welcome Allen owned it. He made stoves in his factory, in his furnace, I should say, not factory, in his furnace across the road. He was making stoves. That's why the house had no fireplaces. It just had chimneys for the stovepipes, right? Um, the floors are in fair condition, random widths. General layout is rather quaint, with three floors in the center. All right, let's go back and look at the house now. He's saying three floors in the center of the house, right? You can see that. One, two, three, three floors. Um, the attic being one large room with a small but adequate stairway going up from the floor below. The front hall nicely proportioned with a wide stairway to the second floor facing the entrance. Both wings have second floor rooms. You see, both wings have a second floor room up there. Okay? The interior woodwork and doors are generally intact, but have no quality or charm <laughs> whatsoever. And the owner's home and address is as follows. I didn't think it was wise to mention your name or the subject of my visit until I had been definitely committed on the price but see no reason why you shouldn't communicate with him directly from here on in, as my understanding was the clear one. Well, do you know how much the museum actually paid? $50. The museum said, 200 is too high, can we get it for 50? They got it for $50. Well, as you can see, it was quite a wreck, right? Anybody, anybody else today would have knocked it down, right? Anybody else would have said, that's going to cost too much to restore. We can't do that. Anyway, interesting story there. Welcome Allen's uh, gravestone is right there adjacent to Emerald Lake in the, what was called the Whitney Cemetery. 
He had to buy his plot from Mr. Whitney, one of his neighbors there <clears throat> in um, North Dorset. I bet you didn't know Lake Emerald had its own cemetery, but it does. Okay, the next stop now, as you're headed north again, uh, on Route 7, on the left, you'll see this red building, which used to be a schoolhouse. I remember it in the 1950s and 60s, it was a fabric shop where you could buy ends of woolen fabric in this place. It's now a private home. And you'll see the, the row of windows on the side right there. It's, it looks a little different. Remember the previous schoolhouse we looked at the, in the barren landscape? No paint, just a very barren landscape. That didn't have the bank of windows. But apparently sometime in the mid 20th century, the Vermont State Legislature decided that schoolhouses really should have more light coming in them, that students would do a better job if they had more light to see by. And so if you see something that sort of looks like, sort of maybe it was a schoolhouse, and it has a row of windows like that, you can probably be sure, yes, it was a schoolhouse. OK, the next house, all right, on uh, stop 15 now on the map, is labeled as the Cook House, right? Is it called the Cook House on your map? No. Or is it the E.P. Luther? OK, OK. First, this was the Cook House in 1795. Then it became E.P. Luther's house. And then it became the Connors Boarding House in 1900. I think what happened, I'm going to show you a series now. These are all interior pictures of the Connors boarding house from the 1950s. I think what happened was before the state uh, widened Route 7 and put together the Lake, Lake Emerald State Park, I think they sent a team of photographers to document everything first. And my guess is this is where the, the photographers stayed, was in the Connors guest house. OK? what the bathroom looked like. And this is Mr. and Mrs. Paul Connors. I love this picture. He's a farmer. He's running a farm. She's running a guest house. I mean, look at her. She's got her pumps on. She's got her stockings. I think she's got a little piece of jewel. Yeah, a little piece of jewelry up here at the neck. I mean, she's running a guest home, right? <laughs> he almost looks like he's been dragged through hell and back <laughs> running the farm for the day, right? And I, and I want people to realize this was, these people were middle class. In 1950, these people were middle class. They were both running two businesses. I remember, this is a personal story now, I remember <clears throat> when I was a kid in high school, we used to get the Boston Sunday Globe on Sundays. And in about 1967 or 68, I was about 15 years old. And my favorite part of the Boston Sunday Globe was the Parade Magazine, right? Does anybody else remember, or still even today, remember the Parade Magazine? Well, one Sunday, I saw in the Parade Magazine a little box down in the corner of one of the pages. And it was a ranking of all the 50 states in terms of average household income. Now, I was so shocked by where Vermont ranked in that ranking that I never forgot it. And that's why I'm telling you the story today. Do you have any idea where Vermont ranked in terms of average household income in 1968? We were number, nine, we were number 47. Only Alabama. Mississippi and Louisiana were poorer than Vermont. I was shocked. I looked around me. All I knew was middle class people. How could this be so bad, right? I didn't have any perspective, right? I'd never been anywhere. I'd grown up here. I didn't have any frame of reference, but I never forgot that. So these were middle class people in 1950. Today, last time I checked, I mean, we have Ben and Jerry's now. We have the Vermont Coffee Company now. Last time I checked, Vermont is somewhere around number 23. 
That's just in my lifetime, just since I was a teenager. So I show this just to give people a little perspective on how much Vermont has changed since the 1950s and 60s. Okay. Okay, now I have a great story for you. In this same house, I have a story written, well, no, Mr. E.P. Luther is a part of the story. Okay, so remember way back, the yellow house, and Anna Damon Luther came up here with her children. She was a widow, and she had her three children, and she met Joseph Sexton, and then they moved next door and bought Dr. Will, uh, Lamar Williams' house, the yellow one. Okay, well, I have a great letter for you that I found. I found this letter upstairs in the archives of the Historical Society. And this, I just think this is amazing that you could read a story of how two people met and married 90 years ago. The letter is dated January 19th, 1949. And it's written by Anna Abbott. Now she's one of the grandchildren, one of the Sexton grandchildren. And she's writing to a niece the niece who doesn't look so happy on her wedding day. <laughs> but anyway, so this is the aunt writing to her niece, Clara. All right, Anna Abbott writing to her niece. She says, Dear Clara, tonight I've just made up my mind that those questions you asked in your note of November 13th, and which have caused me quite a few guilty feelings since, shall be answered to the best of my ability. I think I know the answers, okay? So Clara had been asking her aunt about her grandmother and wanted the answers. So Anna is saying to her niece, Grandma Sexton was originally Anna Wilder Damon. Remember we saw her picture earlier? Married Joseph Sexton, the third wife? And she married John Luther, mother of Parkman Luther, Bro sorry, brother of Parkman Luther, who was Aunt Emma's father. Now, Parkman Luther, that's the name E.P. Luther on your map here, was his house we're talking about here. All right, number 15, stop number 15. That's the house we're talking about. Parkman Luther's house is what is being referred to here, the man. She says, I think they lived in Quincy, Massachusetts, but I'm not positive. She's right about that, because if you look up um, Anna Damon Luther Sexton, she was originally born in Quincy, had her family down there, married her husband, who subsequently died. And so she came up here to visit her husband's brother so that her children could see their cousins. It was that kind of a visit. See, she brought her kids up to see their cousins, presumably in the summer, I would guess. I think they lived in Quincy, Mass., but I'm not positive. She used to speak of Quincy a good many times. Their children were, how about that, John, Charles, and Anne Eliza. Anne Eliza was Ernest Whitney's mother. That's another neighbor there in North Dorset were the Whitney's. The Whitney Cemetery that I just mentioned, those, that was the Whitney family. Okay, so here are the three kids. By the way, all these pictures I got on eBay. I found these on eBay. Gave them here to the Historical Society. Incredible. And they were all labeled. That's the nice thing. You can go to a lot of flea markets and auctions and all, and there's just a bunch of pictures with no labels. These were all labeled, so we really lucked out. Okay, so their children were, she had the three children, John, Charles, and Aunt Eliza. I have heard it said that after Mr. Luther's death, Grandma came up to North Dorset to visit at Parkman Luther's. That's the house. And there met Grandpa Sexton, who was also without a companion. And thus it was arranged. <laughs> Isn't that sweet? Thus it was arranged. And I don't believe either of them ever regretted it. <laughs> Isn't that sweet? Anyway, this, this is what keeps me going, doing this research, is I find things like that, you know? 
And this is what that same house looks like today. All right, the previous picture of this house, again, could have used a paint job around the year 1900. The porch is gone. So this is another thing to remember when you're doing your tour and you're looking at a house. This really is a center hall colonial. This is circa 1795. So you go through that front door and there really is a nice center hallway there. Okay, but the porch is gone. Okay, you're now going to, on your map, you're gonna do, you're gonna do a little loop. You don't have to do a three corner turnaround. You can take your map up past stop number 15. Uh, the road literally curves back around so that you're coming back down Route 7. Okay? Coming back down past Emerald Lake. Emerald Lake will be on your right. And stop number 16 is the BB Home and Farm. As you can see, the sign is out front, the Harold and Jane Beamy BB Farm. It's been in the same family for six or seven generations now. And you'll also notice that directly across the road, the uh, horse show, the Summer Horse Festival is going on right now. The BBs own that land. They own all of that land and always have since the 18th century. And so they're able to rent it out now to the summer festival people who come and have all the horse competitions, okay? So that's on your right, stop number 16. Stop number 17 is on the left side of the road going south. On your map, it's called the Dunn House, right? Number 17 is the P. Dunn House. And it was also Thomas Condon's house. Thomas Condon invented the mop ringer. See the pole, the, uh, the pail, I should say, with the mop that you put in it and, and wring it out, right? Wring the water out of the mop and the clothes stick for, for presumably moving clothes around, moving the, moving the mop around. I'm not quite sure about that clothes stick thing, but he, has, he gets credit for both of those. So he was living in that house right there on the left. It's a very sweet, very sweet house. And uh, it, looked, it looks today almost something very similar to this Courier and Ives image, minus the barn. There's no barn there to the right. Um, but the house still looks very much like this. It's, it's still white, painted white like this with shutters. Very cute little house on the side of the road. That's, as you're going south now, that's on the left. All right, further down on the right again, is the Ames Farm, stop number 18, is the Ames Farm. This is also a very early, uh, late 18th century, early 19th century farm. Used to be called Elmwood way back then. It's now the Frost Well Drilling Company. You will see uh, signage to that effect, the Frost Well Drilling Company. And I was very fortunate to be let inside one day, and they have this very fabulous looking um, hand carved interior staircase in that house. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. I wish I had that in my house, really. Okay, so from here, you're going to drive a little further south. Keep on, keep on keeping on south on Route 7. And just past the East Dorset General Store and gas station, you can bear to the right onto Route 7A. Let's say the gas station is up here, all right? And you're gonna keep coming down here, and Route 7 is gonna go this way, and Route 7A is going to go this way, all right? These, this little neighborhood here on the west side of the railroad and the west side of Route 7 is a little pre-Civil War neighborhood that even I think most Dorseters don't know too much about. There's a pond on the corner with a house that looks just like this today. This is stop number 19. And actually pay attention because this house is presently on the market. If you know anybody who wants a really lovely old historic home in Vermont, this one is on the market right now. This was the Deming House originally, then became the Vial House, and Peter Palmer presently has it for sale. And this is 
when Peter Palmer bought the house, this is the uh, real estate ad that he saw advertising an 18th century farmhouse on two and three quarters acres with approximately 900 feet of frontage on Dorset Pond, attached barn, complete with a ballroom overhead, a reminder of the days when the place was a stagecoach stop, ready for restoration. That's really code, isn't it? <laughs> we all know. We all know what ready for restoration means, right? Peter says even the chimney was leaning over when he bought this house, so it needed a lot of work, but he could see the beauty in this house. Here's the floor plan, in case you're interested. As you can see, the very first front block, shall we call it, of the house is from 1786, and then there were subsequent additions, 1800 and 1840, and the, the circa 1900 little teeny addition, that's the kitchen. Okay, so if you get a chance to see this house, um, I highly recommend it. It's really been very, very lovingly restored. Um, in fact, I have some pictures for you of um, what the interiors actually look like today. And as you can see, um, he did a real period restoration, let's say. It did not always look this beautiful. He took down a lot of 20th century uh, ceilings, walls that had covered up fireplace mantles, you know, I mean, it was a real, um, a lot had been done to it over the years, which is normal, right? People do that to any house, any kind of house, this is liable to happen. This is part of that 1900 kitchen that I was just telling you about, okay? Kitchen, dining area, uh, another area, and uh, this dining area with the painted walls that, that's really the formal dining room. This is more the informal, right next, you come out of the kitchen and this is your, your eating area. I chose to focus on uh, George Vile, MD. This is the man that I was telling you about that um, grew up on this farm. Let me read you, I have his, I have his bio for you, yeah. In 1880, by the year 1880, I should say, uh, Vermont was interested in uh, advertising itself as a wonderful place to return home to. And they put out tomes this thick that were bios of Vermonters that they felt were uh, exceptional human beings and were examples of the reason why you would want to return to Vermont to live with people like this. And what they wrote uh, in 1880 about George Vile was, uh, he was of mixed English and Scotch descent. His early educational advantages were given in the public schools, and he afterwards went to college at Elmwood Institute in Lanesboro, Mass., entering the classical department of Union University in Schenectady. That would be today's Union College, right? He graduated at the head of his class, in 1874 with a degree, with a BA degree, receiving the additional honor of a master's degree in 1877. Resolving to devote his life to the medical profession, he commenced his studies in the medical department of the same institution and received his medical diploma in 1876. For a short time, he practiced in Dorset, but was compelled by the death of his father and grandfather to devote himself to family interests. Accordingly, he took the management of a large farm on which he has since resided. In addition, he has acted as administrator in the settlement of many important estates and has held the offices of town clerk, treasurer, town lister, and trustee of public money. Mr. Vile is a member of the Episcopal Church, but believes that all will be rewarded or punished according to the deeds done in life without respect to creed or doctrine. And they want you to know that he was a Democrat. <laughs> At a town when Vermont was very Republican, he was a Democrat, okay? So, so he, took, he came back and took over the farm. Um, the 1880 Child's Gazette lists him as the town lister at the time and town treasurer, as well as running a dairy of 20 cows and farming 200 acres. So he was a busy guy. 
Here's the Courier and Ives image. I think maybe they visited, visited George Viles' farm, I think. Okay, so you're just gonna drive down um, Benedict Road, is what it's called, and you're going to see house number 20 on the left. Now this is that same Greek Revival style, okay? House number 20, next door, house number 21, the same Greek Revival style. This has an especially beautiful doorway. I really like the way that doorway looks. And also, Greek Revival style, right next door. Now across the road, here's the furnace that I was telling you about. Welcome Allen had a furnace in North Dorset in which he was making stoves and all kinds of other iron works. And, but that one is long gone. This one is still there as you're driving south on Benedict Road. There's a private home immediately to the left on the same property. And the, the uh, factory itself used to be on the right. So all that is left is the blast furnace. Mrs. Curtis' boarding house is also on the right. She became a widow and uh, her husband was a farmer. Once she became a widow, she opened up a boarding house, and that's what you see here. It's a private home now. And also, further on down, on the right, is another Buffum house. Dr. Stewart's house is on the left, another Greek Revival style. I've been told, now I haven't confirmed this, he's listed on your map as the owner of one of the houses, but I've been told that he never actually lived there. So I don't know what that's about. I, I have to do a little more research on that. What did he actually do? And also on the left, another schoolhouse, schoolhouse number 14, right next door. And on the right, there are a pair of houses, this one and the one right next to it. Can you see how they are twin houses? Mm -hmm. Now this house actually is the one that had a fire just about a year ago. Did you know that? Yeah. There was a fire here. This is the Comolo residence. And actually, from my point of view, maybe it wasn't such a bad thing because the two windows on the right now are new. There was an offensive, in my view, an offensive bay window was there, which was not original. And so this house didn't look like it was a twin to this house. But the two, side by side, are twin houses. Okay, that's the end of uh, Benedict Road. You're gonna swing back out onto Route 7 and go down just a little further on your map and you're going to see this place, which is today, it's the Black Goat Country Store. In the back, there's a barn and he has all of his primitive style artwork there. So you are now all the way down here on your map. Okay, back onto Route 7A is where you are. Okay, this, this house actually has an entire book written about the family that originally had this property. If you're interested in the whole story, it's for sale right there in the bookstore. So this was originally the George Marsh farm. George Marsh was a loyalist. He was a Tory, but he didn't have anything against the Green Mountain Boys. So he ran around with them too, until the fighting broke out. When the fighting broke out, he fled to Canada and he left his wife home, handling the property, of course. When he came back at the end of the war, uh, the Green Mountain Boys had taken all of his property except his home. They let his wife stay there. They sold off all his other property that he owned and he had to buy it all back. The re only reason why they didn't kill him is because apparently he never took up arms during his time in Canada. He never took up arms against our patriots, our Green Mountain Boys. So when he came back, they let him live. They let him go back to his house. Anyway, if you drive into this property, right here in, in the driveway, <clears throat> you will see this view of the house. So this is the original wing right here with the central uh, chimney. 
And if you could drive around the back of the house, you see the original salt box roof line. Okay, so this is the original, original, original building on this property. So this is registered with the state. His youngest son, George Marsh's youngest son, was actually born after he came back from Canada. That was Johnson Marsh, and Johnson Marsh is credited with inventing the double shotgun in this house. How about that? So here's the uh, Courier and Ives image of maybe what this property really looked more like uh, before the front, the very nice kind of front building that you see now added to that building. It's sort of a log cabin kind of building with a pond, as you see, right to the left there, so the animals had water. The story that goes along regarding that palm, pond is that Mrs. Marsh, in order to keep all the family valuables safe from the Green Mountain Boys, all of the gold, pewter, silver, whatever, she put it all in a bag and put it in the pond for safekeeping, never again to be found. <laughs> That's at least the myth. Now, I can't verify that, but everybody who knows anything about Dorset knows that story. Okay? So maybe this is what George Marsh's house in the wilderness, or his log cabin in the wilderness looked like, complete with the pond. So that's the last stop on your driving tour. Okay, here are your answers to your pretest. Remember that we started with? The first name of the Wilson Hotel was the Blake Barrows Hotel. I forgot to mention that. Barrows, uh, Teresa Sexton Barrows, married experience Barrows. His uncle was already operating the Barrows Hotel on the east side, what became today's Wilson House. Okay, so today's Wilson House was originally the Blake Barrows Hotel. Mad Tom Road used to be called East Road, just like we have Dorset West Road. Used to be called East Road. Bill Wilson is first cousin twice removed from Vermont's first millionaire that we talked about earlier, Silas Griffith. And Bill Wilson, I think everybody knows, right, is the founder of AA <clears throat> and was born in that house, the Wilson House Hotel. George Vale, we talked about, is the doctor who gave up medicine. The inventor of the clothes ringer lived on Route 7, North Dorset. Lake Emerald is the lake that has its own cemetery. And the Green Mountain Boy slash Tory was William Marsh. The town poor farm was Caleb Buffum's house. And Ira Cochran built the original Wilson House Hotel. And Wilcom Allen's house, I'm calling Vermont's first model home because he was showing off these newfangled cast iron stoves as the new way to heat your house and his business partner was Samuel Wrightout, the carpenter, who actually built the house. So I'm saying that that house that went up to the Shelburne Museum was actually a model home. It was showing off the carpentry of Samuel Wrightout, and it was showing off a house with no fireplace mantles, a house that had four chimneys that all used cast iron stoves. So that's why I'm calling it, that's my thing, I'm calling it Vermont's first model home. Okay? And thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.